Thank you very much, Steve. I think that was very excellent. As I said, you can download a copy of his article from QEX from the hamside.org website. Okay, next, Dr. Phil Erickson uh, talking about how to use the time tick variation from WWV um, for, uh, for measuring ionospheric variability. Bottom up. Thank you. One last comment on the previous talk. Uh, someone was talking about timing with regard to the eclipse. It turns out that it's not just the umbral shadow where there's the total shadow. The penumbral shadow extends hundreds of kilometers in either direction. We actually measured during the eclipse in Massachusetts. The de electron density dropped to factor two, which was a thousand kilometers away from the totality path. So it's not as, not as simple a question about what time things happen. It's a very interesting problem. Okay, I'm going to continue with the WWV theme a little bit. I, I'm grateful to see you're doing an excellent job of showing the, the use of WWV. I have to thank the National Institute of Standards and Technology for putting all the effort over decades. It's the first, it's the first signal I really heard, uh, I think, when I was tuning around as a shortwave listener, because it was always there. Um, so uh, on a suggestion by my colleague Bill Lyles, um, we're trying to use a little different part of WWV as perhaps a simple ionospheric sensor. This is research in its early stages, okay, so hopefully you can follow along with us as we go through this. Uh, these are my collaborators, uh, uh, team at UMass Boston, Ethan Miller and Gary Bust at Johns Hopkins, Catherine Mitchell over at University of Bath, and these fine sponsors. And some of you may remember, I'm a little young for this, but some of you remember that fellow who is John Cameron Swayze, who used to do the Timex commercials. And he used to run watches over with trucks and say, it takes a licking and keeps on ticking. Um, so, WWV does take a licking and keep on ticking. Um, so, the central question was, can you actually look at not just the carrier, which is what Steve was talking about, but can you look at the one second pulses, the time ticks that we used to set our watch by, and use that as a low cost distributed ionospheric space weather sensor. You have an, an ionosphere which we know now is not regular, it's got 2% to 20% electron density variations as it goes along. And that's going to create a number of different refracted ray paths. And so maybe if we're receiving the ticks on the ground here, there's something about the ionosphere buried in that information. So we decided to check that out. Um, a little bit of more background on WWD. Again, Steve really introduced this very nicely. Uh, by the way, this is a QSL card from 1940 from someone who listened to WWD. I don't know if they still do them, but you could write to them and find out. Um, this, of course, is part of the nation's time and frequency services. Uh, surviving it and attempt to defund it. It is a still a fundamental uh, service, as you might know, at 2.5, 5, 10, 15, 20, and the 25 megahertz transmitter is on sometimes. That's 10 kilowatt power, and it is, keep, it is kept synchronized to the NIST primary time standards, um, so it's, the time is going out quite accurately. Um, these are the transmitting towers, by the way, and Steve mentioned WWVB down at 60 kilohertz. And there's also a WWVH in Hawaii. If you listen, you can hear sometimes the voice at 1200 and a tick at 1200 hertz overlaid on top of the one from Colorado. What does it sound like? Well, again, that's where I started listening to it with, where my, my uncle's Helicrafters SX-110. Nowadays, you can find, for example, the Kiwi SDR um, and uh, all of you will now have familiar ways of nostalgia listening to that. Um, and by the way, the wonderful thing about Kiwi SDR, which is a web-based SDR, there's a bunch of them, including this one in Fort Collins, which is not that far away from the transmitter site. Now, the ticking is what we're going to focus on. That 100 hertz tone, pretty low, that's always happening, never gets turned off. Because WWV has a tremendous amount of information that they bury in here. Uh, there are, you know, the, the, the upper tone shift between 440, Hertz and a, and a kilohertz, and um, but it's this subcarrier, this 100 hertz subcarrier that's happening every single second that perhaps we can use as a sensor. Um, and in fact, that's a binary coded decimal. It's, if you hear it, you can hear that some of the pulses are a little bit longer than other ones, and so they're basically the shortest one is 0.17 seconds, and then the other ones are longer, 0.4 seconds, um, and that's encoding, for example. Uh, that you can read very slowly, minutes, hours, days, time of year. Um, so there's even information buried in those ticks. What we're going to be looking at is the leading edge of the tick. 
um, whether short or long, that the leading edge of the tick comes along every second. This is me simulating what that looks like in a spectrogram. So this is frequency in hertz here. This is the carrier wave. And this is seconds. This is about 20 seconds. And there's that pulsing at 100 hertz every second. And you notice I threw about a 20 dB fade in here every few seconds. Anybody who's listening to WWV or any shortwave broadcast knows that you can hear that thing sometimes happening. That's my simulated signal, which I wanted to have to test the algorithms I'm going to just show you a plumbing diagram for, because, of course, that's the real world. Um, that's my backyard. And uh, so we have nice QRM flying all over the place. My receiver oscillator was not right, so it's offset. We get fading. You can see the harmonics in here. Um, that's a little more challenge for a piece of software than, for example, this is. But you can test your software with this. So this is the plumbing diagram, and it was all done in Python, which is a wonderful language that I encourage you to learn. And it was done using a software-defined radio and a digital RF package, something we've developed at Haystack to basically store raw voltages with uh, time tag information and pull it very nicely. You take your WWD recording and you start doing radio science with it. You mix it. You mix this tone down to uh, baseband. You, you keep only this tone. You look for the edge. You run a matched filter to reject other stuff that isn't the tick, like little blips that you saw in there. And then you find the edge. And then you basically also then take this thing and um, look. And this plumbing is designed to look very closely at the edge, not just amplitude detected, but actually look at the phase variations. So for example, this is just a little snapshot, 1.4 seconds into this recording. The blue is the envelope. The actual, the blue that's oscillating faster along with the magenta here is the actual uh, 100 hertz wave. What I found was that if you just looked at the amplitude, the fading, when, when the signal fades by 20 dB, it's really hard to find where the edge of that is. It starts doing this a lot. And this is up to data. But if you find the edge and then go and count the first time that that wave crosses through zero, that's much more reliable. So that's what we're going to end up using just to watch the ticks come in every second. Like my son said, the world's most boring experiment. So, what happens if I put my perfect simulated data into this? Well, I sure better ought to get out a pulse that happens every second. So this little histogram here is the time I expect that tick modulo one second, so it should be just a, a perfect bin at zero. Great. My detection algorithm is working. This, by the way, is the amplitude because I threw in some fading in there, but the point is perfect arrival of that tick every single second because I simulated it that way. The next thing we wanted to do was go get some samples of a, tr of a transmission that was only ground wave, very close to the transmitter. So Ethan and Gary were at the uh, Ursi meeting out in Boulder. And they drove right here where the transmitter site is here. They were about a kilometer away from the transmitter site. So they hauled a software-defined radio, an Edis USRP N210, a little ARR preamp, some power conditioning because this was done in the car, laptop recording Linux. Those of us tend to like Linux. And uh, there's the transmitting towers. This is, in fact, a recording. It's not a simulation. Look how clean this is. I mean, this is almost a perfect, you would think it was simulated. There's the ticks happening. And you notice the strong harmonics because they're a kilometer away from the transmitting station. So what does it look like if I just find those edges? It looks like that. This is, a, this is only 1 dB of scale here. So it's pretty much constant amplitude. There's a little bit of spread. So there's not much propagation spread on the ground wave. Uh, this is in milliseconds. Uh, this is in seconds. So that would be like a millisecond here. So there's probably you know, about 100 microseconds of variation in that tick coming. And that's just the ground wave wiggling a little bit, but not too bad. Remember my backyard, all of this stuff. What happens if I apply exactly the same analysis to that? Remember, we're slicing out this tick right here, and we're looking for these edges. That's what happens. That's the ionosphere, folks. So what have I done? I've done about the simplest experiment I can think of. I watched the tick come in every second. And I compared it to the local copy. So I'm pretty sure that, that, in fact, this is ionospheric. And this is the beginning of the story. But if you're trying to create a fairly effective and, and really low-cost uh, low way to monitor the ionosphere, having the transmitter do all the work on the other end and having the NIST people pay to keep the transmitter synchronized is a good idea. 
So let's talk to John Cameron Swayze again. Um, I think it's got real potential as a simple distributed ionospheric remote sensor, but we have to figure out what the results mean. We have to figure out how to actually extract an ionospheric parameter from this particular thing. I'm doing some follow-up stuff um, that I hope to report to you later. So stay tuned, and I want to just mention that this is a collective effort, thanks to me standing on the shoulders of all of these folks, but seems like it has potential for a citizen science experiment. So, yay WWV, write to your Congress critter and make sure that they keep it going, please. Um, it had some problems in the NIST budget later this, uh, earlier this year. Uh, let's try to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, the equipment's there, it's running, and look at the stuff we can do with it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phil.